Oi you, it's time for another episode of Dorothy and the Dealer. Let's tune into the conversation. Cool. We're really excited today, aren't we? Yeah. It's been about a year since we've been um, waiting to get this uh, special guest onto our podcast. So it's really good um, to welcome um, Damien Mander, who is the founder and CEO of the International Anti Poachers Foundation. Yeah. So welcome, Damien. How exciting. Really there's a couple, of, there's a couple much, of lasses, yeah. lasses in this office here, mate, have a bit of a crush on you, I have to say. They're they're very taken back by your vision and your mission, and <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're they're very grateful to uh, have the opportunity to, uh, and we all are to have the opportunity to sit and talk to you here. Yeah. Well, I, I won't argue about their taste, but I will apologise for being late today. Uh, <laughs> those of you that are listening, um, I will commence uh, five thousand push-ups after this interview. Uh, <laughs> that's what would have happened in the military, something like that. So, yeah, sincere apologies, guys. Uh, no, sure. that's no all problem. good. No all problem. right. So at Dorothy and the Dealer, we like to start with seeing what our guests uh, are listening to, what your favourite song is of the moment or in at all time. What's your favourite song or what, what's your go-to song, Damien? Oh, I've been listening to a lot of old school Rolling Stone stuff at the moment. So either either uh, uh, Paint It Black or, or Little Red Rooster. From like right. mid 1960s. <laughs> Do you know any of those no, two songs? I don't know Do you reckon, Damien, you'd be able to sing us a give couple us a, of Give us a bar. Give us a bar. Just give us a quick. How does it go? <laughs> <laughs> if you see my spot. little red rooster, please drive him home. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's so good to see that um, the different tastes that people have with our podcast and the different songs. Mitch was trying to lead you before into saying Africa from Toto or something, yeah. but no. Nah. Nah. <laughs> I've also been it. listening to a lot of uh, Murat. Which is a, a it's a new genre. It's a German techno marching band. Uh, really? M A U T E. Look it up. Look Let up the videos. Let me check it out. Uh, M A U T E. I'll on check YouTube. It out. Okay. Yeah, that'll, that'll get the party started. Oh, now, um, that's a good place to start this podcast. Well, actually, Lily, you, you've stuff. obviously you've obviously been a bit of a partier. We'll get to that as we as we go through. Um, one of the things after listening to uh, a couple of your interviews. Um, you know, I loved the, the the fact that, you know, the adversity that happened in your life, you've turned it into something really, really extraordinary. Like we meet people that do extraordinary things, but what you're doing is, is, is so extraordinary and so dangerous, but yet so beautiful. And so like, wow, you know, like I, I was really taken back by, by, by what it is your mission is and, um, and what it takes to do that. And I think for, for our listeners, I, I'd like us to get to, to the sort of person that it takes to be able to do what you've chosen to do with your life, which I just think is so noble. But it, what, I mean, originally, where do you come from? Where, where you know, what, what happened back there? Well, if I was to walk into your room at, when you were 10 years old, what would be on the, what were the posters on the wall? You know, what would the books be beside your bed be? What, what, where, where did it come from? Where did you come from? 10 years old, uh, 10 years old, you would have just would have been Guns N' Roses days, uh, yeah. and you would have had a, a mixture of Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield posters uh, on the wall. And, yeah, you used to get, get down to the pub as soon as those posters went up and rip them off the wall. But so I, <laughs> so I, I, um, I was born in, in Melbourne, actually, a place called Mornington. It was about an hour south of Melbourne in, in Australia. And uh, at a very young age, uh, moved to Sydney uh, about three months ago. I did this with my parents, by the way, not, not yeah. crawling myself to Sydney at the age of three months, um, as independent as I do like to be. Uh, and dad ran hotels. So I, I, grew, up in, I grew up in hotels, hey? Uh, and, you know, we ran some big hotels. And one of them, uh, the Manabal Hotel in, in Sydney there, uh, you know, one of those highest growing grossing hotels in the, in the state. And so I, I grew up around adults. I grew up yeah. in an adult environment. And uh, I went to school there, moved back to Melbourne, I think just before I turned 10, and, um, and then picked up life uh, back, back down in Victoria. Yeah. And then, yeah. then, so even being from Melbourne, and, and that's where most of the family is based these days, so I, I've spent more years in Sydney because that's where I went back to with the military eventually and, and was based out of there living there so yeah right right and then so um being raised in in hotels and um, 
were your parents publicans? Were they were they hoteliers? Or? Yeah, yeah, they were. Um, you know, this is back in the days before you know a lot of the security companies and that were operating, and and you know sometimes you know, a pretty rowdy crowd. And if you want someone kicked out, you had to do it yourself. So you know that was that was seeing that was how I grew up watching. Uh, Watching mum and dad, uh, you know, have to have to be able to manage not only the pub but um, what can be uh, a pretty wild place, Sydney, back in the early eighties. Mm, right, right, right. And then, how old were you when you left home? Uh, so I uh, would have been nineteen. Hey, yeah, when I left um, left to join the military. Still remember mum standing there with tears running down her face. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, so what? I mean. You know, our, our, I've always said our, our voids or our perceptions of missingness give way to our values, you know, which determines our destiny and who we become. And so what was the pull to go to the military? Because it's a fucking big choice. Like going to the military at a 19 years old, it's like. Yeah. I, and I remember my dad being so disappointed that I hadn't gone on to university and, and or college, what we would call it. Uh, but I, you know, I'd, so my, so, so around, and I suppose, you know, we all, we all go through, you know, rough patches or just periods of uncertainty. And for me, who was so desperate to figure out who I was at the time around sort of 18, 17, 18, 19 was, was even more profound because it was, and there's a lot of pressure that go on, it goes on us these days. You know, at the age of 15, we're going to choose the subjects we're going to do when we're 17 and 18 that decides what we get into university when we're, when we're, we're, after high school and decides basically you know what we're going to do for the next 10 or 20 years and it's very mm. fucking hard to ask a 15 year old what they want mm. to do for the rest mm. of their life and mm. i almost think we should get our asses kicked out the door and go and you know work in a backpackers or you mm. know try a few different trades travel the world uh work behind a bar and actually actually grow up a bit rather than try to figure out what you want to be when you've grown up before mm. you've even come close to it Mm. Um, so I, I'd started working as an, uh, well, actually just to go back to the diving side, because it'll loop back around to the military. Uh, there's obviously some stuff in the middle there. Um, so at, at, at a, I think around the age of 13, then yeah, I was hanging, you know, we, we were naughty little shits, um, you know, always looking for a way to make money or, or, you know, generate some income so we can buy some weed or some beers mm. or whatever. And, um, uh, we, we used to go to the fishing store and we'd still fishing lures, uh, in particular the ones used for calamari fishing. And we'd go down to the wharf and we would we'd sell those to the fishermen. You know, you'd scuff them up a little yeah. bit so they didn't look like they're straight out of the packet, like you were some <laughs> little shit that's just stolen them. And, right. uh, you know, and the reason they're buying these things is because they keep losing them. So I thought, well, maybe we can steal a mask and snorkel and go down and find <laughs> some of the stuff that's down here. I mentioned the word theft a lot here. It was, it was always not necessarily a fact of not having stuff. It was always just a, a challenge uh, amongst your mates. And that's, yeah. you know, these are the wrong crowd. You know, you don't look back at it now, you know, you're stealing from a small business or something, someone that's trying to make ends yeah. meet for their own family. Um, but, you know, these are the, the little lessons you get along the way. Uh, so it started snorkeling, uh, free diving and collecting fishing lures and then actually for once earning my own income and uh, and being able to sell those back to the fishermen and then just putting myself through more and more dive courses, uh, getting better gear, getting better equipment, getting up early in the morning and going jumping off in you know, ice cold waters down off the, the, the southeastern tip of Australia there. And uh, it, was, it was good money for a kid. And um, that's what eventually led on, you know, as a kid who's done just grown up diving, I spent more time in the water than out of it. The ultimate job is to be a Navy diver. Hmm. And that's uh, eventually where I went when I was. So, uh, so were you 19. young then? When, when 19. You, you were 19. Sorry, no, when you started diving and getting into the water, yeah. were you 15, 16 or? Uh, 13. 13. 13. Right, right, right. Yeah. But I, I, don't, I mean, I'd grown up in, in, in the water. Uh, yeah. Just never had really got into the diving or snorkeling or spearfishing side of it. Right. And I say spearfishing is not something I do now, but it was something that occupied a hell of a lot of time for me uh, growing up. Uh, but by the time you sort of get to 18 and, uh, you know, I was out, you know, working a regular job, uh, lost that. Uh, mm -hmm. had, by that stage, I had a loan to pay off a car. And so, the, I mean, the only job I could get, I was, I was literally working on a fucking garbage truck. 
uh, mm-hmm. in the Melbourne in a Melbourne summer chasing chasing a garbage truck around. And, um, I don't want to do that again, hey. Uh, it's <laughs> tough work. It's tough, tough, stinky, smelly work. And yeah. uh, I just there was an ad that came on the radio one day because I'd already tried to join the Navy as a, as an electronics te- as a as a clearance diver uh, right. a year earlier, but they weren't taking divers from the street. Uh, you had to already be in the Navy before you could transfer category. And then I just right. heard an advert on the radio one day saying that we're taking uh, we're taking um, uh, electronics technicians uh, in. And so I just I signed up straight away, went for the interviews. Uh, and then yeah, I was probably about seven or eight months uh, before I, I went across, um, you know, to start recruit school. But it was during those seven or eight months of, of okay, truck anymore, but still needing money and wanting to have a good time before I went off to the military. Not that the military didn't turn out to be a bloody good time, but uh, you know, started started you know selling drugs and hanging out with people that well, actually not hanging out with people. It's just the group of friends that I've grown up with that had morphed into that that side of things. Uh, not right. all of them, but but a good you know enough of them to be to be led astray. And you know, it was easy. You know, these guys are having a good time. They're partying. They get got their own house, and uh, you know, money comes in quickly and it goes out quickly. And mm-hmm. you know, that for me looked like a an easy way to 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 turn a buck. And um, I'll never forget it. Hey, it was uh, it was about a, a week or so before I went uh, into the navy, and it was winter. So I think I joined um, joined in June, so that's a Melbourne winter, and so it's cold. And I had this like huddled up black uh, Holden HZ Statesman uh, with a three hundred eight engine, like the big muffler. You know, so I come like hooning up the street early in the morning to you go and see the lads because they're still all going from the night before. And there were four of them um, handcuffed face down on the front lawn. I just sort of froze and, and uh, this big this big dude in a suit just walks over to my to my car and just leans in on the window. And he's just like he's like right up like this. And it's like um, Mr. Manda, do you want to join your friends or do you want to go to the Navy next week? I said, really? I'd love, to, really? I'd love to go to the Navy next week. Please, sir. And he goes, fuck off. <laughs> and uh, out of those four friends, two are, two are now dead. And one's just got out of prison recently, hey? Jeez, wow. Man. Count your blessings, mm. hey? Mm. Yeah, That's sometimes just... all you need is, is just a, a you know, stranger to give you a chance for an opportunity. Yeah. And yeah. A copper to lean in the window with... and tell you to fuck off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, was, when... that was my sort of second chance, I suppose. So when you got in, you, you went in for, to dive for diving, but you didn't stay diving long, did you? Or did you get a chance to do it at all? Well, I went in and started training as an electronics technician electronics. and then yeah. put in a uh, request diving. to transfer a category yeah. uh, to clearance diver. Uh, they wouldn't. They said, no, we, we don't need more divers. We need more uh, technicians. And right. so um, I wrote a letter a day. Uh, I think in the end it was about three months a letter a day to the commanding officer and eventually got dragged in, um, uh, got, got threatened, got threatened uh, with, um, you know, being charged with insubordination and, you know, you've already been told no and then eventually got told to fuck off again this time to Sydney to go to dive school. Oh, um, really? And then later, uh, later, you know, speaking with some of the people that were in the divisional uh, management then, they said the only reason we sent you there is because we knew we knew you'd be back very quickly after failing the course. But um, I never went back. Really? Um, right. So, so you get out there. I mean, w- one of the things I always hear that the army is notorious for is is teaching you not to think for yourself. But to, and and it, I, I I I always when I'm ever I'm talking to a soldier or anybody I I say tell me what your opinion of that. So what's your opinion of that? Um. No, it's different, definitely not. Um, so, well, I mean, I was in the Navy first before I transferred across to, to the Army. Um, yeah. You know, it depends, depends on what job you're doing. Right. Uh, you know, with, with, you know I, was, I was over in special operations and uh, you know, there's a huge amount of, of initiative that's left up to you, mm-hmm. uh, a huge amount of, of responsibility that's left up to your initiative. So... Uh, I, like the rank structure is not so much 
as recognised. It's uh, everybody's passed the course. Everyone's done the hard work. Uh, the blood, sweat, and tears have gone in, and it's sort of like this mutual respect through through the ranks. And even in the unit that I was in, we, we didn't wear a, a, a uniform. It was it was a, you know it was a set, of, set of black overalls or green overalls or camouflage, whatever it may be. Right. Um, it wasn't like this formalised, regimented uh, idea that you have of, of the of the army. And if you remember, remember that that scene in Forrest Gump, uh, yep. you know, what, what's your purpose in life? To do whatever it is you tell me to, drill sergeant. <laughs> it's like, God damn it, Gump, that is the best answer I've ever heard. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it wasn't wasn't really like that. Uh, yeah, obviously, the selection processes and selection literally is uh hell on earth uh and they, mm. they do they, they break you and then they rebuild you and uh and when they rebuild you you, you become part of a brotherhood mm. uh of you know the very smallest of percentiles in the, in the population of, of people that make it through those programs and, and in a way and i've said it before that they, they sort of are the ultimate boys clubs you know it's not mm. a membership you can buy you've got to go and you've got to go and get it and, uh, and very few people have had it, and it's, it's, um, you know, I remember getting through the first, the first selection onto the dive course to see that, uh, um, uh, the clearance diver acceptance test, uh, which is our version of Hell Week, and then there's very few things that will, will, you know, strip you as a person bare to, to your soul to make you understand who you are and, and what you're capable of. And, yeah. And most of the people, most of the people will fail going through that process and you know when we did it, it was before the all the mad occupational health and safety regulations yeah. came in so you're literally getting one or two hours sleep a night for 12 days uh you know waking up to go to go and swim for six hours uh mm. in freezing cold water only to find that all your wetsuits have been put in the freezer overnight and are now frozen solid you're trying to get into a frozen wetsuit 2 a.m wow uh, and then just it's just, and it, it, it genuinely is. It's 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 eighty percent mental and twenty percent physical. Yeah. Uh, and they do, you know, that. Oh, I mean, you'll be standing there. It's called speed dressing. So you'll have like three different outfits. One will be a wetsuit and fins. One will be overalls, um, boots, and then uh, one will be PT gear, runners, shorts, and a t-shirt. And I'm just, you, you'll have, you'll be lined up on the on the wharf on the back of a boat for hours and hours, and I'll just say, dress number one, two minutes. And then everyone's in, and then if you, if someone's slow, you're down doing push-ups. You might do thousands of push-ups throughout the course of the night, and they'd be like, "Okay, dress number three, thirty seconds." You know, just wow. getting dressed and undressed in you know, freezing cold water. Just the monotony of that. Wow. Uh, it's a it's a head fuck, and then you've got people whispering in your ears. You know, it's just come, you can come and have a hot meal now and a warm bed and a, and a zuba, and it's true. If you pull off, you can go and get all that shit. Go back and get a hot, a cold beer and a and a hot meal and, and, and sleep or you can continue on with the course. And that's, yeah, I remember passing that and just going, fuck, anything's possible now. Mm, really? So yeah. sleep deprived, food deprived, cold, wet, all the things that are, that are, you would think would break you actually are making you. So where, 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 once they've done that, where did, where did they take you then? I mean, obviously you get into a unit, you're working with, with uh, other team members, you know, and I don't know whether you've read any of Stephen Coulter's stuff about flow states and he goes in and speaks with a lot of Navy SEALs about, you know, how they operate as and get into these flow states because then, you know, they're kind of hacking consciousness and getting, yeah. becoming one unit. So where did they, where, where did you end up then? What happened next? Uh, so I deployed to, well, actually, well, then I started dive course. That was just the beginning. Uh, then you go into a nine month dive course. Right. Um, you know, the, you know, the maritime tactical operation phase of that, uh, you know, literally from Monday to Friday, you're working a hundred hour, hundred hour week, uh, you know, and between four and eight hours of that a day is, is finning underwater. So you will oh go to La five, La five, uh, breathing pure oxygen, swimming at about six meters depth. Uh, and that's, that's for doing, uh, uh amphibious assaults on, on beaches or wharfs or ships. And, uh, you know, so you need to be able to swim 2,000 yards in, in an hour and you just do that over and over again all day. 
so that that was the only phase after after the acceptance test that was I, what I found physically uh, mm. probably mentally more challenging than the acceptance test itself. But mm. yeah, nine months of diet course, and then I was actually posted to sea for a couple of years. Uh, so yeah, which was fun. You know, I was on a small boat, mine hunter. I think it was a crew of about forty four people. Uh, but you, you mean turning up in foreign ports uh, with you know a bunch of mates that ha- hadn't seen land uh, or, or beer for weeks and, uh, and and hadn't had anywhere to spend your pay packet so yeah all, all the romantic stories of the navy uh, that, that, <laughs> that you see and hear about they're all true yeah yeah so you ended up becoming a, a sniper right can you tell us about that yeah, so I so I, I went from uh, being at sea to one of the dive teams. I worked also at the dive school there as an assistant instructor, uh, and then I think I was back at sea at the stage. Mm-hmm. And then uh, obviously September 11 had happened. Australia stood up uh, tactical assault group East, uh, which is was a mixture of um, army and navy. Uh, all the navy guys we had to go over to the army go through their selection programs and, and training programs. And then, yeah, and that's, I, I really struggled. Uh, that was even less physical and, and more mental. Uh, it'd be going through, I mean, literally within a short space of time, your skill. Fire four story house filled with smoke, uh, no lights. Um, uh, you've got your, your gas mask on, your respirator on, uh, you're shooting live ammunition. And if you're not the people doing the run through uh, on, on the targets that you were given to, to shoot in the house, then you're standing on each side of the target. So you're literally shooting live ammunition wow. uh, within extremely close proximity to, to your best mate's heads. And wow. um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, there's, there's zero room or margin for error in that. And, and I, I really struggled with that course. Um, it, was, it was called Close Quarter Battle. Just really struggled. And um, then I remember getting, uh, we were called in on the last day. There were five of us. And most, you know, the whole the large majority of the course has already been, uh, been lost at this stage. Uh, like, you know, failing certain, uh, for certain tests. Uh, there were five of us called in on the last day. And mm-hmm. basically, listen, you know, you guys are, because of fucking struggling, and uh, today is the last day of the course, and your last opportunity to show us that you you, you should be here. And of those five, I was the only one that, that made it through that day. Uh, I remember getting the letter. You know, they give you a letter, you take it back to your room, you read it, tells you if you pass or fail. And it's just bursting into tears. You know, mm. uh, you know those big tough yeah. tattooed. Uh, now special forces dude sitting there sobbing in his room because <laughs> yeah. it, it had been such a head fuck. Uh, yeah. And then, then I was on, on, on the teams uh, at the unit and uh, I've been there two days literally and they said, you're going to do sniper's course. It wasn't, right. it wasn't even a question. It was like, this is where you're going. So did everybody go and do that? Or were they handpicking people that they thought had a certain skill? No, there was only, only two of us. Uh, right. So we were sent over to the, the, um, uh, to the SAS training barracks uh, in Perth um, and put through, put through the sniper's course over there. Uh, before returning back at the time, was it, what was the second commando regiment where, where tactical assault group beast was, was housed? Right. Then did they drop, did you end up then, I mean, were you deployed, I know you were deployed into Iraq a few times. Um, how long before you ended up seeing some action there? So, I mean, our roles, our roles were uh, with the unit that I was with, that was right. domestic counterterrorism role. Uh, when I went to Iraq, I, I left the military uh, and worked for private militaries that were subsequently employed by a US-led coalition uh, in Iraq. So, yeah, I went over, I mean, straight away from the first job that we, um, you know, I signed up for over there, working with, um, it's actually very interesting. Um, it, was, it was a team of Australian lawyers and diplomats that were helping to retrain uh, or rebuild a legal system that was going to trial Saddam Hussein. And whilst we had nothing to do with that other than providing security for the Australians that were over there, right. uh, we got to sit in on some very interesting meetings. I think there was there was seven judges on the initial panel that was supposed to trial Saddam, and not one of them made it uh, to the actual trial alive. They were all assassinated. Really? Wow. Yeah. My God. 
<laughs> how do you get your head around it? I mean, how did you get your head around it? Like, that's insane. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's where rocks, are, you know, I was in the same place and was insane. And, and they, yeah. you know, these are the things that happen, um, so, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So, what happened in the end? Like, how did you, like, what made you, you know, move on from that? And where, where did that take you? So I went on. I went on from doing like security work uh, or this close protection work uh, into training uh, in Iraq, uh, training Iraqi initially Iraqi National Police, and then training and mentoring the uh, the special police, so the paramilitary uh, wing of the police. And this was a mixture of Sunni and Shiite recruited at mass as quickly as possible from all over the country. Fucking disaster! It was a fucking disaster, and. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I learned some lessons at the time, which didn't become lessons until like some sometime later when I could look back on them with a bit more, mm. bit more, I suppose, water under the bridge. Um, and then I eventually ended up working um, with uh, a, a team that was uh, deployed with the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Aegis, a program called Matrix out of Baghdad. I remember too, you know, the, the teams, there was still all, all the, all of us had come in, you know, from other organisations or whatever, and because they were standing, they were expanding the project uh, in Baghdad and and other parts around the country, and and you know, I remember, remember set two, um, you know, security team two, um, which actually we do recon with the U.S. Army um, Corps of Engineers, looking at major infrastructure that had been destroyed and needed to be rebuilt. Um, so we would look at things from a security standpoint, whilst the the core would be looking at it from a bricks and mortar standpoint. Right. And um, I just remember um, being in the ops room and they're like, okay, there's two positions available on set two. And everyone knew that was the team that had the command sergeant major. Uh, and he doesn't like to fly anywhere. He wants to drive everywhere. So it's the team that would be getting a, a shitload of action. And uh, like no one put their hand up. So I was like, fuck, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And straight away, my best mate, uh, Dino, um, his hand shot up. And people are like, okay, fucking sweet. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it was, um, yeah, it was an uh, interesting time, say, living in, living in Baghdad, to say the least. And I'd, I'd already been stationed up in northern Baghdad for, for quite some time in a place that was, you know, much hotter in terms of uh, daily attacks and, and that than what the green zone was. So yeah. my next project with Atrix was based out of the green zone, but previously living in Adamia, which is not far from, from Sada city, uh, you know, the Shiite stronghold there. Uh, and we had a Sunni, we had a Sunni general living on our base, you know, only a few miles away. And I remember being there the day Saddam was hung and just having rockets and mortars and everything come over, you know, because we, you know, we had such a strong a Sunni presence in the, uh, in the training facility there. But, uh, you know, it was the stuff that was going on around us. And I mean, the first night I got to that, that base, we had three rockets come through the, through the, front, the front gate. And it's like, oh, shit, you know. Wow. And we, we, we'd, we'd been sent in there as a replacement team because the last team had been taken at gunpoint uh, as part of like a hostile takeover of that project. Uh, so we were sent in there uh, as part of CPAT, Civilian Police Assistance Training Team, uh, working with the US Marines to, to try and, stabilize that program and, and get it going again that's incredible if we if we think about like we'll talk about it in a minute about what you actually do and i don't know this is there's two questions here i have for you and before i get into the two questions did you enjoy marching powder <laughs> great, great book what, right that, what the, the, book? The, the book the or, book or, or the, the experience or, or, or <laughs> living the real life story <laughs> yeah. um i thought boy probably Maybe not as, as well written as, as what it could have been, but nonetheless, the, the story carries carries it yeah. through. And it, yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's it's. I mean, it's it's fantasy shit. I mean, you, well, you say what's yeah. what do they say? Real life is crazier than fiction. That's yeah. uh, you literally can't make that stuff up. No, but um, I, does it actually? I don't know whether you've read Shantaram. Have you read Shantaram? Yeah, I have. Hey, yeah. Did you yeah. like it? Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Hey. Yeah, it was, it was a great book. Um, so just yeah. if we can just explain what you do, and then if I can ask the question, what humbled you? Something must, something must have happened that, that humbled you, you know, because it seems like, you know, you were this soldier, 
you know, on the end of the end of the sniper rifle in fucking crazy situations. And then to go from one extreme to, I suppose it's still an extreme, but to be doing something that is so fucking noble, like something must have happened. So can you just in, in brief explain what you do now, what the foundation is, what it does for women, what it does for animals. Um, yeah. And then what, if you can tell me what you feel was the, the moment that you were humbled to be able to give back to where you obviously do. Okay, yeah. Um, so after leaving Iraq, spent a year in South America. Maybe we'll get back to that after this and talk a bit <laughs> more about marching powder. Uh, I sort of really, uh, I, I, was, uh, I would say, uh, you know, as, as a person and spent a year of drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, it's a big problem with a lot of ex-service members and just, you know, from the unit I just spoke about, Tactical Assault Group Beast, had a good mate uh, commit suicide a few days ago. So we just, you know, in the process of helping the family, uh, you know, I mean, even during COVID and all that, um, helping the family get back to Australia and, and um, yeah, prepare for Maxie's funeral. Um, so, you know, and I spent a lot of time lecturing in the States 22 US veterans a day commit suicide there. It's, you know, it's a real problem. And you know, we, we, you know our, our, our leaders leaders keep sending away uh, our children to fight their arguments, but not ready to pick up the pieces when they come home. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I was one of the lucky ones. The downward spiral of drugs and alcohol for me became a kick in the ass to get, get my shit together. And, and uh, Africa was the next step and came over to Africa and having, you know, it's not like there was a major epiphany moment. There was literally like a moment that just became the point of no return. And there was a there's a whole bunch of stuff in the decade before that led up to led up to the formation of what has now become the International Anti Poaching Foundation. Uh, so we set up in in 2009, and that was after spending six months uh, working in the field with rangers and, and seeing what it is they do. Uh, after coming from units that we had millions and millions of dollars to do what we needed working in systems that had billions and billions of dollars to go out there and destroy countries. You know, that sort of, sort of shit plays a large role in, in humbling anybody, I think, uh, mm -hmm. if you've got the conscience to look back and reflect on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I suppose it's, it's, it wasn't like there was, there was this big, huge overnight shift in me and it's like... Um, a progress that's, that I would say has been going on for, for years now. And you know, every day I'm, I'm conscious about how can I do a little bit better today than what I did yesterday in something, or you know, I'm happy to critique myself. Uh, but it's, um, you know, we, we, we don't have billions of years to evolve like nature's had. We've, we've, as humans, we've got a handful of decades at best. Evolution is the cutting away of the bits that don't work and retaining the bits that do. And, and that's essentially what it's been for me over the years. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to lie. There's still there's still a little bit of ego that creeps in here and there. And, and to a certain point, it can be can be healthy. There's still you know the the alpha type thing there. And it's it's you know that's there. And it's it's just a matter of of I don't know. It's just trying to be honest. And and you know, for, I mean, there's so much period as a, as a kid. You know, from that so that 17, 18 year uh, age through to sort of mid mid to late twenties when it was just you know what can I do to impress uh, you know from hunting animals to joining various units in the military to you know how many houses can I accumulate uh, in residential property was for uh, whatever reason it might be to, to try and make money or. or or have adventure, but the other half was also to try and impress people and you sort of get to a point and realize that the only person you need to answer to is yourself. And if you can't do that, then nothing else really matters. Mm -hmm. So what was that turning point though? I th like I've heard you say that you you witnessed an animal in pain. Can you tell us about that? that and you realized yeah. that that was a turning point for you? Yeah, the, 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 there was a couple of major, major things that happened one seeing a, a buffalo with a, her leg caught in a snare. This is a, a Cape buffalo, uh, one of the most powerful and dangerous animals uh, uh, in Africa. And definitely the one that when you're on foot on patrol, uh, you, you're most mindful of. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the only animal that will hunt a human out of spite. It's, um, really? 
Yeah. Um, and to see this sort of powerful, majestic animal stuck there in, in a snare, uh, you know, that in itself was tough but when we had to euthanize it because she'd ripped her pelvis in half. Uh, she started giving birth to a stillborn calf. And that's, um, yeah, this sort of, uh, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd killed animals, I'd cut them open. Uh, you know, I've had, I've had lots of blood on my hands from, from seeing bad things or doing bad things to animals. Uh, and that's shit that I have to live with. And, and uh, but I don't know what it was, that buffalo, but that was fucked up, hey? Um, in a way, in a, you know, it was sort of a, a, a rebirth. Um, so it was a combination of that and seeing an elephant with a, with a face cut off or something is the size of a truck killed for something you can hold in one hand. Yeah, you sort of get to a point where it's just, uh, you know, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Mm. So do, do you feel getting in and, and setting this up, I mean, were you angry about it? Were, I, 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 were you angry about what was going on and that's what was driving it? Or were you like, no, um, we, have, we have to fucking do something and everybody needs to be a part of it? It wasn't, it wasn't anger. It was, uh, it was just sorrow, I think. Uh, right. you know, and I, I just, um, I never had cared for animals. I think, you know, uh, Iraq was a way of breaking down a lot of the barriers for me, I seeing a country and a, and, a, and, a, and a people sort of flattened and oppressed like that. Uh, and knowing that you, you played a part in it, you know, it's some serious reflection there, hey? Mm. And um, yeah, so I, I, so these, these sort of, you know, I call them so these plates of armor of ego and, and machoism that I'd put around myself where have been slowly getting chipped away at uh, over the years. And I, I don't know if that's a, that's an experience thing or if it's a, um, you know, just an evolution thing, or maybe mm. a combination of the two, but uh, just, you know, getting older and wiser and a bit more time for reflection outward outwards and inwards uh, on, on who you are as a person and what you know what what is your purpose you know, purpose is the most elusive thing in life and you know a lot of us spend uh, our lifetime looking for it and uh, you know, what asking myself what is my purpose what what, you know, what, what can I do uh, and you know, that sort of point I had uh, I, I had a few things I had money uh, I had a certain set of skills that I thought could be useful uh, to help in this situation and, and I had time. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think you, like, by the sounds of it, you were identifying with that whole masculine ego side of it. And this, like, this thing obviously humbled you enough to go, right, that's not all of who I am here. You know, there is another side or there's this other part of me and I can actually do something to help. Is that, yeah. that's how it sounds to me. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it is. I know it wasn't even, it's not like a matter of sitting down and writing out all the yeah. things you're going to do in the future on, on a piece of paper. It becomes infectious. You do a little bit here and then it's like, okay, that's cool. It grows or you get some more funding to, to make that bigger. And then it's, you got to step, take the next step up as a person, as an organization. It just, the momentum just keeps growing and growing. It's like, you know, I say to a lot of people, you just take the first step. Just take the first step and then just keep trying to put one foot in front of the other. And it's just that, that evolution thing. Just you don't have to do it all overnight. And, and even, even when we're talking about the vegan movement and all that, I think, you know, we can be our own worst enemies because people, people will be shitting on other people for, uh, you know, you did this or you did that. You know, it's not perfect. And it's like, well, okay, I fucked up or you fucked up. Who cares? You know, mm, yeah. it's, it's just sorted it out tomorrow. You know, I think this is one of the things that when I was, looking at your work and actually one of our friends introduced us to your work and she was talking about how you um, you understand why people do what they do, why the poachers were doing what they did. You know, I see this is in, mm. for me, I've seen over the years, you know, you see on Facebook or you see somebody posting a picture of these guys killed this animal and then all the comments underneath, they should be shot, they should be killed, you know, somebody who skinned yeah. them alive and stuff like that. And I'm like, that is you basically, those people who are commenting are basically demonstrating the exact 
traits that they're condemning in the other person and it's like yeah. that doesn't that doesn't help like i think that's yeah. that's just you part of the problem. The, it's part of the problem and uh, understanding both sides of the scenario i think make a difference mm. can you speak about that a little bit yeah it's, it's definitely you know the the responsibility of, of socioeconomic development i think unfairly falls on on the shoulders of conservation as an industry so much. We're out there trying to do work in nature, but we can't do the work in nature unless the communities that live alongside us uh, are functioning well uh, or have support. So then there's this, this double load we have to try and deal with. And, and to be fair, community development, or for at least for us as an organisation, but for most organisations that start out in, in conservation, community development is not part of the original strategy or vision or, or, or more importantly, skill set. And you know, for us, and I, I mean, I used to start my lectures in uh, by saying, "I know what we're doing is not the right thing, but I don't know a better way." And think of think of what we're doing as a as like a paramedic uh, trying to get this mm. situation to the operating table, so so someone with a better idea or better solution can 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 save it. And that's that's when we're working in what was an increasingly militarized environment. Uh, or the, the militarization of the conservation industry when I, and that was happening or escalating just as I stepped into the industry in 2009, the beginning of the Rhino Awards, uh, people with my skills, uh, there, was, there was more and more opportunities. Uh, the Rhino deaths were going up each year. People are, are combating that with military grade hardware, military, military techniques and tactics, bigger fences and more guns. And you know, I, I knew, you know, as, as we scaled as, a, as an organization uh, in size and, and geographical footprint, uh, and some of the more, I would say, um, you know, tougher assignments that we're taking on uh, in terms of the threat level that we're facing, uh, you know, it became more and more apparent that the, on a continent that's going to have 2 billion people by 2040, that we're not going to save nature with, with this militarized uh, outlook. Uh, we need to find a way to get communities to be functioning with conservation, not separate from conservation. Uh, and while we keep drawing the divide between the two, uh, we've got to remember that in, in, for thousands of years before we, we put fences around national parks and called them national parks, people lived with nature as part yeah. of nature. Uh, we didn't have cities that separated traditional migratory routes. Uh, we didn't have towns that, that blocked off or, or wanted to... Uh, where animals wanted to go and drink. Uh, we didn't have uh, villages uh, that, that want to cut down a forest and, and establish themselves where one species may be endemic to. So accelerating over the last a couple of hundred years, in particular the last 50 years, and uh, you know, we need to find a way to, to create that balance and build a bridge back between, between conservation and communities, between nature and people. So how, how do you think you, how do you feel, uh, I, do you feel you guys are getting traction there? I mean, how are the numbers? What, what, what feedback are you getting that tells you, hey, look, we're on track. We're, we're actually getting some traction. Here. Yeah, so we, I mean, for, so us as an organisation, just to give the listeners some context, uh, in 2015 to through to about 2017, we were working on this project in Mozambique. Uh, it was in increasingly militarised, uh, and that was the turning point for us in saying, okay, we, we are going to find a different way to do this. Uh, looked at a lot of different models of what was happening, looked at other industries, uh, and then looked again uh, in, internally at conservation and us as an organisation. And there are a number of factors that eventually led us to trial what, what has become now become more scaled to become the only network of nature reserves in the world to be, protect, to be protected by women. All, all female armed uh, anti-poaching units. Uh, the, you know, so there's a whole whole list of reasons, but uh, yeah, that's where we've come to now. And I'm extremely happy about the progress uh, and about where we're going. Uh, the results speak for themselves in terms of, which is, I mean, in the initial area where we started, we had uh, uh, a, an 80% downturn in elephant poaching uh, across the region. This is a this is a region that had lost 16, uh, sorry, 8,000 elephants in the 16 years prior to the establishment of this program. Uh, and so we played a large role uh, through our on the ground work and through our investigations work and community development in helping to to really drive that number down. The areas that we take over uh, or 
I said takeover. I mean, we established long-term leases with uh, 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 rural district councils and, and local traditional leaders and community. Uh, they're all former trophy hunting areas. Uh, so these are areas that are being lost to human settlement and agriculture as the trophy hunting industry declines. Uh, and around across Africa, around 3% of the entire surface area of the continent is set aside uh, as areas under communal land trust. And the economic model that has been used uh, in many decades has been commercial uh, tr uh, trophy hunting. Uh, so what we, we've, rather than look at hunting as an argument to be had, we looked at it as an equation to be solved. Uh, and for the listeners out there, trophy hunting is different to poaching. Trophy hunting is, is legal in many countries, mm -hmm. whereas poaching is the, the illegal um, exploitation of natural resources, uh, whether that be you know, killing elephants for their tusks or, or uh, you know, buck uh, or planes going for their... Uh, uh, for the meat, uh, other animals, the pythons, for example, for their skin, whatever it may be, uh, you know, that, that is the illegal version. The legal version is the hunter coming over from America, so to say, so he can go out and shoot an elephant, stuff it and stick it on his wall. Uh, the first area where we started with, when we started with 16 women uh, in general as a program, we now have 240 staff uh, uh, spanning an area of about 400 kilometres from east to west. Um, the first areas had a had a wild, an increase in wildlife numbers of around three hundred ninety nine percent now. Wow! Uh, that, that was only after that was only after after three years. Uh, there's all, all, all these other metrics and things that we're learning along the way. You know, the the empowerment of women in these programs, something we didn't expect, led to a sixty percent downturn in, in serious sexual assault and rape cases. Wow! Um, uh, some of the some of the things that we've seen. In, in, in what we do, uh, I mean, the, ec the economic side, uh, which is linked to the lack of corruption that we've seen with women, the economic benefits of this program, uh, where we had historically recruited males from hundreds of kilometres away to come in and protect these areas to avoid collusion with communities they'd grown up with. Uh, as we've scaled, we haven't had to employ it from miles away uh, because we haven't seen corruption with the women. Uh, wow. So it means we can employ directly from the community alongside the area we're trying to protect. And it turns the largest line item in our, in our budgets, which is a range of salaries into a direct community investment. Uh, on paper, we're putting the same amount into these communities every 34 days as what trophy hunting was doing for Adam uh, prior to its demise. Wow. Uh, and then the, bo the bottom line then triples because it, women are spending 80 to 90% of their salary on... Uh, Versus a male that's spending thirty to forty percent. Sorry, just so, say that oh, look, again. We, women were spending eighty to ninety percent of their salary on just spending a local community uh, right, versus right, a male yeah. that spends versus a, 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 a male that spends around thirty to forty percent of their salary locally. So this is mother um, nature, though. Hey, it's not father nature. This is the feminine energy yeah, is definitely yeah. the more the more dominant energy. Mm. So I'd like to ask a little bit more about that and about that, that whole, because that is like, that is empowering, I think, for a lot of people mm. to hear, for a lot of women to hear. But what what led to that in terms of like, and and I don't know, just talk to me what, about what the clicked? female. What, why think, why yeah, women? What, what clicked? clicked? What, what did, where did you go? Oh, shit. Look, look at this. Let me just have a wipe down here. I'm sure. sweating up. <laughs> you look gorgeous. Degrees. Don't worry, Daniel. You um, look lovely. <laughs> I'm dripping. Um, so we looked at we looked at other industries that were getting ahead by getting more women on the boards, more women as CEOs, more right. women in management. Right. Uh, versus the conservation industry, where women uh, women were outnumbered by men in frontline roles by around a hundred to one. So lacking lacking the exposure uh, to the experience they needed to rise up in the management positions uh, meant that we, we would stagnate as an industry if we didn't create that exposure. Right. Um, we saw a lot of women in conservation with other organisations uh, that were essentially put a uniform on and a weapon in their hands to get the, the, the photos taken for fundraising or whatever it may be this form of tokenism and you know certain projects in particular where 
we knew men were actually doing the the hard yards and women uh, were in the window front, so to speak. And so I sort of undermined the women because they weren't given the opportunity to do the full job and it undermined the men because they were actually out there doing the, doing the hard yards but not getting the credit for it. Right. So for us, it was just a question of, you know, can these women do selection? Um, and, you know, we still weren't convinced. Uh, I, I was having a very tough time at board level in, in freeing up. It seemed a bit gimmicky and, and risky for an organisation that had sort of beaten a fairly large drum from the the military front uh, of how we go about doing our, doing our job. And you know, for us to sort of what would maybe be perceived as a, as, a, as a softening of our image, it was a risk. Mm. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say that. Mm. Uh, then I read an article, I was actually in New York at the time, read an article online in the New York Times about uh, the US Army Rangers putting women through uh, their training and preparation for frontline deployment. And... Um, yeah, so this was a decade earlier in Baghdad uh, when we we're on a mission um, heading up to um, we we're heading up to, towards Camp Anaconda in northern Baghdad, and um, one of our convoys had been uh, hit uh, coming through a checkpoint. Uh, there's a few people there killed at the checkpoint, and we were surrounded um, uh, the local sort of Mahdi Army uh, militia. Um, yeah, I had a Dushka anti-aircraft gun. Um, held to my head uh you know so i was like fuck this is it and um it was the u.s army rangers that came in and uh, got us out of there alive really and so yeah re reading that article a decade later i'm like okay if these wow. guys can um, train women for deployment to do the same shit that saved my life 10 years ago then uh we can do the same with women here as as uh as wildlife rangers and that's that's when it started essentially love that a number of years ago, um, I, I, I've spent quite a bit of time in India, and a number of years ago, I ended up at a fundraiser uh, with a woman from Karen up in, in Perth, and she was uh, rescuing the sun bears, and um, she had she was she had um, basically been in China and lifted up this basket, and the sun bear was there, and she wanted to find out what was happening, and then the, realized the dancing, dancing bears, what they call yeah. the dancing bears, and they. They take them away, they pull their nails out, they pull their teeth out, then they put them on a chain, and as tourists go yeah. past, they make them dance. And, and, and I've seen that a few times in India, even up until today. But she had she was doing a fundraiser, and then we got an invite out to where the actual uh, compound was that she had set up. So when we went out there, it was a really interesting story, but I'm just based on what you're saying, I'm starting to get my head around what had happened because I was so taken back by when I went out there. Because when I went out there, the first thing that I noticed is that it was in the arsehole of nowhere. Like it was literally mm. in the middle of nowhere in India. And India's a, you know, India can be a dangerous place as much as anywhere can. And when we got there, uh, there was armed guards all around the compound. And I was like, was there armed guards around the compound? They were brought inside and we're, when we get in through the gate, we're met. It was a kind of bit of a, it felt like a bit of a setup and it's no disrespect to this woman. She's obviously trying to do the yeah. right thing. And, and, and we were taken by four um, vets and we were walked through the garden. As we walked through the garden, like over here on the right, there was a, a, a bear that was still chained up and he was dancing from side to side. And, you know, that's all he did all day. And then we, they brought us around to where the, uh, the clinic was and there was a bear in a cage and he was running up and bashing his head off the cage. And so I was like, Jesus, this, I was really unsettled. I was like, there's something not right here. And I remember saying to them, you know, what's what's with the bear over here? And they say, oh, you know, they when, when they're taking off their, their owner, they go a bit crazy. And I said, what about the bear in the cage? And they said, oh, you know, he's, he's just suffering because he misses his owner. And then, you know, we were brought in, shown around some stuff, and then we were taken back out and we left. And then, but when we were there, I was like, how many bears you got in here? And they're like, oh, we have 44 bears in here. So I didn't see 44 bears, and I don't know where they were keeping them in the compound. And so when I got out, I was, I was like, but, you know, I was, you know, how, how are you doing this? And they said, well, we would go, we go down to them and we take the bear off them. And then what we do is we give them some money and they'll go and buy a rickshaw. And then they have, rather than earning money from making the bear stance, they're able to, you know, earn money from the rickshaws. But it turned out that we, we kept in contact and within a month, there was only two bears left. And then I was like, so why did you just have armed guards on the place? They said, because the locals come over and they can't understand why we will feed a bear, but we won't feed a human. And they, they'll chuck meat over the wall and they'll poison, they were poisoning the bear. So they were shooting them. Jeez. 
shooting at the people and, and you know, to keep them away. Oh, yeah. And then, so 42, 42 of the bears had died. And we were like, so, you know, talking to the, to the guys, you know, what did they do? He said, most of them died of heartache because they missed their owner, you know? So, but I can see, like, the, the thing is, is I can see what she was trying to do. And you have to start yeah. somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Like, you have to yeah. start somewhere. Yeah. You may not get it right at the beginning, but the point is that we have we yeah. can't ignore it either, you know. And these people, you know, these bears, their owners are their master. They love them, you know. And you take your, an owner away from yeah. its master, it breaks the, the bear's heart. Yeah. So did you guys go through any of that sort of stuff? I mean, did you just did you just how do you how do you negotiate how, people who are making money to feed their families by selling ivory or or tusk or how do you how do you handle that? Is that part of the conservation? Yeah, plan? you know, this is, I mean, I'll tell you the toughest part of our job is is uh, is having to arrest someone and put them in prison. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, you know, quite often it's someone involved with organised crime and, uh, you know, that's that's actually a pleasure. But, you know, the, the poor villager that that is, you know, trying to, trying to make some bucks here or there, there's nothing fun about that, I promise you. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing glamorous. Uh, there's no smiles. Um, but I... I don't know if this is a way of me reasoning or justifying in my own mind, but I, I look at where we are as a global community. I, I look at, uh, we're with 8 billion people uh, on the planet uh, at a time when civilization has been brought to its knees by a small scaly anteater called a pangolin and, and some bats. And, and that is, that is our, our pressure on biodiversity and on nature. And our, our, our future as a civilization is dependent on our willingness to preserve biodiversity. And uh, at some point we need to draw a line in the sand and say, we, we have to hold on to what we have left because if we don't, there's, there's too much at stake. Mm. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the, the, these are the tough jobs that we have to do on behalf, the tough jobs and tough decisions we have to do on behalf of an international community. Uh, and you know, look, at, look at the thankless, often thankless job of a ranger be thankless, uh, such as this woman who's, who's protecting bears, thankless mm. in the eyes of the locals. Mm. Uh, a ranger often, okay, often ridiculed, even assaulted by certain groups of people. Uh, but when, we, when we're looking at, at whether it's traveling to Africa, whether it's watching it on television, reading about it mm. in magazines, whether it's the importance that our biodiversity brings, uh, the, that all comes down at the end of the line to one group of people and it is the group of people that protect those areas mm. uh, and without them out there now doing that fifteen four hundred dollars a month risking their life every day spending 11 months of the year away from their families we wouldn't have any of that nature and uh, so when we sit we sit on the other side of the world and be grateful for the air that we breathe and, and the nature that we can visit or switch the telly, telly on and watch we really need to acknowledge the work that rangers do. And who knows what pandemics rangers may have stopped in the past or, or will mm. stop in the future just by mm. protecting these animals from reaching wet markets in the first place. Mm. Uh, and I, I fully acknowledge there's a huge machine that, that, that operates below the rangers and keeping them out there uh, deployed on the front line and fed and clothed and equipped uh, and led uh, and the fundraising that goes into it and the reporting and, and the events and graphic design for the posters and the legal staff and the contracts, the government negotiations, the land negotiations, the community work. But we need to give more credit to these people. I mean, we, we sit there, sit back and hail and worship uh, people that can smack a tennis ball around uh, mm. better than others or kick a football around. Yeah, they just got to get kicking footballs. They're not out risking their lives or anything for a bigger cause. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we like to have a beer and, and, and watch the sports on TV, but I think we really need to shift what our idea of a hero is in, in society. Uh, it's the people that are out there doing shit like, uh, like what the yeah. Rangers are doing. Yeah, I'm not feel, someone that, that makes yeah. fucking $15 million a game playing football. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, obviously, obviously a big part of the fucking problem is consumerism. You know, is that is yeah. super super high net worth individuals thinking it's an honor to be given, you know, or to give a piece of ivory as a gift? Yeah. Like it's it's so fucking ridiculous. Like it's just it, 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 if they just understood that that it's it's not an honor. In in actual fact, yeah. it's completely the opposite. So yeah. is there is there any way in which you guys are 
are, are trying to go at that end of, of the problem. Well, that's the education side. Like even as mm. I hear you talking about the dancing bears and mm. what you were talking about there, Damien, mm. to me yeah. it seems like that's where education needs to come mm. in. And with this, that's yeah. is that an yeah. is that a is that a part of what you do, you know, and how you help and give it's back? Lo locally, um, yeah. but we in Asia, for example, uh, not to highlight part of the problem um, by, by saying that, specifying that, but there's organisations that operate uh, and they're specialised in advertising and demand reduction as what we are in on-the-ground solutions. But, I mean, like, we, we can't... I, th I find it difficult to get up on the soapbox and point the finger and, and mm, talk about yeah. someone's cultural history... Mm. Uh, or traditional medicine uh, uses um, when we as a society, oh, when I say a society, the West mm -hmm. really has so much to answer for. Uh, and, and if we want to talk about, if we want to talk about the, the receipt of these goods the, the, or receiving these goods or wanting these goods, it's no different to someone wanting a Rolex or someone wanting a, a Ferrari or someone wanting a bigger house or a fancier suit. Uh, or a flash, you know, flashier car, whatever it may be. And, and a lot of that, it does, it comes back to ego. It's like, look at me, look who I am, look what I have, look what I can afford. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, the, the, the constant battle for so many people is, is, is with ego. And when you, when you realise that it, it's actually not cool, it doesn't look cool, uh, and you don't have to buy all that shit, you don't need to live in a big house, and you don't need to spend so much money trying to keep up with other people that are in your network so that you don't feel like you're getting left behind. Like the freedom that comes uh, with being able to let go of that mindset uh, and, and understand that you can live in a, in, a, a, in a reasonably small size house. You don't need, you know, all this other flashy shit around you and, and, and all the fancy stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it's very liberating. Mm. One of the things I, I uh, you know, when I was listening to one of the interviews that I, I, I really got is that you, you know, we have this idea of, of what a man is. Do you know what I mean? A, a man yeah. is strong and all this. And, but yeah. in actual fact, it's, it felt like from the interview, like it was so, it was, it was really lovely and it was really humbling to hear you talk about, look, this is what I did. This is who I was. But what mm. a real man is, is someone that realizes that that's not all you, that you are. And, you yeah. know, you're, you're, you have taken off a lot of the armor. You have put down, you know, you have looked at who you were. You have taken where you've come from and turned it into something quite extraordinary. And so if, if like, it, you have the blokey bloke out there who thinks, you know, there's someone who thinks that they've got to be big and strong and shoot and kill and, yeah. you know, and do extreme yeah. shit. What, what's your message to those, to those guys to help them to realize that that's actually not what the fuck it's all about? Yeah, it's not, you know, the more people that want to live like that, the shittier the place is going to be. Uh, yeah. yeah, more people that are going to suffer, the more people are going to be hurt. Mm. Uh, and, and really it is, it's just... It's just a little three-letter word called ego. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, I still get shit from, from mates and other people <laughs> about the, the, the vegan side and, yeah. uh, and um, fucking tofu boy and all this, like, whatever, man. Uh, mm. You know, it's, it's well, one, one, I am an alpha male because uh, it's just who I am and I can't change that. Two, I don't want to fuck with something that can't defend itself. Okay, I've done that before and I won't do it again. And three, I don't want to pay someone else to do my dirty work. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about what we do to animals here. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not cool. And you know, we do things to, to, to animals that would be classified as torture or, or murder if we, we did them to people, but we were able to separate uh, what's convenient for us and, and what we like from what we don't want to acknowledge. Mm. And... Uh, yeah, for me, it, it, it all just came down to the, the, the genuine understanding and realisation that I don't want to be a part of that system anymore. I'm, I work in conservation. Uh, it's the protection of the environment, the protection of animals. The meat industry is the, the greatest negative environmental impact we have on this planet and responsible for the death of over 100 billion animals a year. Who the fuck wants to be part of that? 
Mm. It's, it's one of the main drivers of climate change. It's part of the reason we're, we're on our knees right now with COVID-19. Mm. We can't fly around the world and see our families. We've been looking at trillions of dollars in international uh, economic deficit. Mm. Just because we're doing, we're digging the our appetites and uh, and we're taking so much along along for the the, the ride with us that's mm. not right it's just we, we don't need meat we just like the taste of it mm. yeah i just like i think we attach so much to the these ideals of who we're supposed to be you know and who what a man is and i think we think that strength just looks like that machoism, but strength is also the ability to soften and be sensitive and understand that other other creatures have just as much um, to mm. offer. You know, I, I was hearing you say about the difference in one of the um, I don't know I don't know what animal you were talking about, but you were saying that they could tell the difference between the two different tribes. One tribe had tried to harm them and another hadn't mm. and they could hear mm. it in their voices or something like that and mm. I feel like yeah. you know we, we we think that we're all that just because we have this way of communicating but just because a, a, another species doesn't know how to communicate in the same way it doesn't mean that they don't understand and they're not they're not sentient beings mm. and they don't have um an understanding or a consciousness you know yeah it's, it's you know I mean animals uh are so much more complex than we can ever comprehend uh, in so many ways and uh, in so many ways we're blind and deaf to, to what is going on in their world but the the language of of suffering is universal yes and i suppose that's that's the key point for me the, the only difference between the capacity and the capacity of a rhino to suffer from a cow is the difference uh we allow ourselves to accept in our own minds and that that's that comes down to conscience Mm. And what what level of our conscience are we willing to acknowledge? And if it's part or none uh, or, or 99 percent, then really, is that the person you want to be? Mm. Uh, and when, when you allow it to be 100 uh, percent and you can make decisions based on what you genuinely believe to be right and wrong, it's a big step. Eh? It's not an mm. easy step. No, it's no. a much fucking tougher step than going yeah. down the gym and putting on 20 kilos of exactly. muscle and, yeah. and learning how to shoot a gun and getting into a bar fight. That shit's fucking easy. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 100% mm. of your conscience. You know, we I, I could talk for another hour, but we do probably have to wrap it up. But before we do, um, how what, how would you recommend people can help or support or what yeah. what are the tips that you would give to people to be able to contribute in some way or even... Um, in their own lives take responsibility in some way? Yeah, I think uh, definitely from a nature perspective is, is to research what's going on, uh, be, be more informed, be more educated. When you're better educated, you, you're better armed uh, mm -hmm. to, make, to make the right decisions. And often, you know, for a lot of the big changes that I've, I've been able to make uh, individually or as part of the organisation, uh, has been based on research uh, or inspiration uh, from, from other people that are involved in our, in our movement or range of movements that we're working in, whether it be conservation, environment, climate change, uh, the animal rights side, uh, and then find organisations to support or how you can support them. Uh, mm. It doesn't necessarily have to be us. Or those that want to know more about us, the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, IAPF.org, um, mm. and there's, there's a bunch of information on, on not only on, the, on our website but on the internet, uh, there's a great documentary that was recently produced by James Cameron uh, in, in conjunction with uh, National Geographic about the women of Akashinga that is available on our website. It's only a short form documentary. There will be a long right. form. Uh, ha have, a, have a look at that. Uh, but also in our own lives, you know, how we can, uh, small changes in, in our lives uh, equate to big changes in others. Uh, and if we, I think the biggest mistake we can make is to think that the accumulated effort, effort of a lot of people is not going to add up to something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm, it's the biggest yeah, danger. Definitely, yeah. Uh, and we we have to we have to start taking responsibility about the actions that we have on a day to day basis. And and building up some good credits over here doesn't give us fucking bad credits to go and do bad shit over there. Yeah. For example, working working in in anti poaching in Zimbabwe doesn't mean you can go home to Australia and. and uh, 
you know, sit there and, and feel it's okay to eat eat a big steak because you're protecting all these animals over here and you, you've sort of built up the right to eat these other ones over there. And that's the mindset I operated with for, for several years. Mm. Uh, but I think that, that, that any of us can make is, is our diets and what we put on our dinner tables, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and just you know, looking at where our food comes from, uh, the suffering, the pain, uh, the environmental destruction. Uh, and I mean, really that uh, we can we actually do more by doing less if we just mm. cut some things out of our life, we're yeah, doing far less, like but achieving much more. And that's 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 the crazy thing about all this. It's not a lot of us just have to do less of what we're already doing to make the world a much better place. Mm. I really like that. You know, I, I'd like to think I'd like to think that we're on our way there. And and what I want to say is that it, it's been lovely talking to you today and um, very humbling and I think that what you've achieved and what you've done so far is absolutely fantastic and um, I, I, it's as I said it's been an absolute pleasure to, to, to sit here and have this conversation with you thank you so much for giving us your time thanks very thanks much so guys much. I really appreciate your time and the time of the listeners and uh, I look forward to uh, doing a um, an update at some point in the future yeah that'd be awesome. yeah absolutely 100 percent. <laughs> we didn't even get to the marching powder conversation that's a whole <laughs> other story actually i had an anti-poaching story i wanted to ask him about as well i had a mate years ago and um, when i was this is very quick i won't i won't keep you on but i had a mate years ago i was up in the far north queensland and his name was john gurnia and he'd grown up in queensland and um, he'd studied environmental science with a buddy of mine, and then at 22, headed over to Africa and became an anti-poacher. And okay. um, he, he told me the stories. He said, we, you know, we were armed. He said, we'd head out in, into, the, into the bush. And he, he said, we would capture a poacher. And then he said, we'd bring him back. And he said, we'd chain him up. And then we'd, from behind them, we'd cattle prod the chains. And he, he said, they would think that they were, you know, there was the gods, um, you know, paying out on them so that they could then question them and find out, okay, where's the rest of the poachers? And this was what they were doing. I mean, obviously that's, that's 20, 25 years ago that they were doing that sort of stuff. Yeah. But it's obviously evolved since then um, about how they find that sort of information out. But he was like, some of the stories he was telling me, I was like, holy shit. And he was 22 when that stuff was going mm -hmm. on. He said he had a mate of his had a lion as a, as a pet. And you know, the lion would walk around the house. He said, a fucking full fucking lion would walk around the house in a compound in a cage, and that was his pet. You know, and he hung out with this guy and drank beers with him, and they'd get drunk, and the fucking lion would be there. And the only reason the lion was there was because they were feeding the fucking thing, you know, and it wasn't hungry, it wouldn't eat them. But um, yeah, crazy, crazy. That was the first time I, I heard about any any um, any of this anti poaching stuff was when I was 22. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's evolved since then, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I think Damien has cut out there, but um, Again, it was great, great, job, great having job you on Damien. there, Damien. Hopefully you can hear this. <laughs> if you found this information inspiring, make sure you subscribe and tune in to the next Dorothy and the Dealer podcast.